Hey, it's Irreverent Aegis here, and in this video, I'm bringing you another trifecta guide, this time for Veteran Scrivener's Hall. In this video, I'll be showing you how to get the title Curator's Champion, and we're going to do so using what I call the ALT, or the Alternative Tactic, also the acronym for Aegis's Laziest Tactic, where we do as little as possible to get the result we want. Now, sometimes there is a trade-off between being lazy and dramatically increasing your likelihood of death. So in those cases, we'll often choose to follow the mechanics to avoid frustration. If after watching this, you think there's a lazier way to get Curator's Champion, feel free to put it in the comments. And if you're right, I'll give you a shout out. And if you're wrong, I'll make you the feature of my next hate mail video. At the start of the fight, everyone will drop all their ultimates and push the boss to the first scavenger hunt phase. Since I'm running Nunatok, I do give my healer a 4 second countdown. That way, she knows when to extend Major Brook. When the first book NATO is summoned, I recommend just keeping him there. That way, you can maximize your time on target. This isn't very risky, as your DDs should know what they're doing at this point if you're going for the trifecta, and you'll take minimal damage, as seen by my health bar. A quick tip for the exploding AoEs, designate someone to take the far one and the close one, and if there's any ambiguity, always make it so that one person is the person designated to move, that way there's no confusion. If your DDs are still off doing the scavenger hunt when the second book NATO comes up, feel free to pull the boss out of the tornado, as we don't really need to worry about time on target there. With two DDs, my recommendation is completing two scavenger hunt phases and burning past the third. The risk to reward ratio swings too far towards risk and actually requires a much higher level of skill for all players involved to skip all the mechanics in the fight, in my opinion. This changes if you bring three DDs, and going with a full burn strategy might actually be less risky since you won't need to survive as long. Here is our DDs returned from their second scavenger hunt phase. We dropped all of our ultimates course, extending Major Brittle one last time with coordination between myself and the healer, and we burned the boss down from that 34% to zero rather quickly. Now that the warm-up's out of the way, let's burn through some trash and move on to the controversial second boss. Why is there controversy? Pray tell. Well, on an online guide that I wrote for this dungeon, I suggested that on the hard mode of the second boss, you should ignore all of the mechanics and go with a straight burn strategy. And I suggested that any guides that say you shouldn't do that are wrong and actually make the fight a lot harder to do. Somebody didn't like that. And this person's actually a really awesome player, makes really awesome content online, and I have a lot of respect for the guy. So this is just a difference in opinion, and it's not really all that controversial at all. But controversy gets views, so... I'm kind of trying to make it seem like a bigger deal than it is. Aegis' laziest tactic for this fight is to simply have your DDs stand there and parse, focusing solely on the boss. To help cleave down adds, they can run sets with AoE damage and modify their bars to include more AoE abilities, but they will never focus the adds. The healer will simply stand there and heal. None of them need to move for any reason ever, with one exception, to get out of the mechanic, the floor is hot lava. After the boss re-emerges from the first lava mechanic and beams everybody, the tank should get right up to it and face it towards the center of the room. The DDs and healers should line up to the left of the tank, where they will remain until the next lava mechanic. The reason why is that all the adds will have to run past the tank to hit the other group members. This makes it incredibly easy for the tank to find and taunt all of them when it is time to do so. If the tank is parked against the wall, it's hard to grab aggro, as the boss will get in the way. For the tank, the two best times to grab or reapply aggro on the adds are right away, when the first evolved broodling floats by, and then immediately after the poison spew. After the spew, the green blobs should be the taunt priority, as they are a bigger threat when untaunted. If you notice that we are not stepping on bugs, interrupting the broodlings when they are channeling, or roll dodging the blood boil mechanic, it's because those things require effort and situational awareness, things that are way beyond our level of competence. When the boss puts out the second lava pool and relocates to the center of the room, your goal should be to have it to 45% health or less. This will allow you to beat it before the third lava pool. If you are between 45 and 55%, you'll probably get an extra one, followed by a beam. For our extensive testing, this strategy still works, but it isn't as cool. 
Notice after we got sucked in, we all followed the boss to the middle. There is no need to relocate the boss to the outside wall, as that just results in a loss of time on target. We all dropped our ultimates one more time and continued to ignore all the mechanics, with the exception of me grabbing aggro on the atro. After a few more seconds, the boss dies, and voila! We have proof that the alt is way cooler than the meta. ALT forever. Before the final battle, everyone slotted Vigor. This wasn't because our healer wasn't awesome, rather it gave our DDs more room for error if they found themselves out of formation. I also slotted it because I was often intentionally out of heal range in the final room. As the tank, I also chose to slot defensive stance for the additional block cost reduction, block mitigation, and emergency damage shield it provides. In the first room, after the first cookies AoE drops, the next cookies notification will appear above your head approximately 15 seconds later. From the time of notification to when they drop is around 6 seconds, meaning new permanent AoEs will land on the arena around every 21 seconds or so. For the first two sets of cookies, everyone should pixel stack on the tank so the AoEs all overlap and don't overtake the room. Assuming the first cookies were placed in the top left of the arena, the frost circle should appear in the bottom right. After the boss unfreezes, the second set of cookies should be placed in the bottom right. After they drop, the tank should move slightly to the left to ensure the next frost circle is placed in the top right corner. The third cookies will appear when the tank is kiting the boss into the second frost circle as you can see here. The tank can place this in the corner and the rest of the group should place theirs out of the way in the bottom left. If group damage is good enough to earn the trifecta, only 3 or 4 cookie AoEs should drop, and only 2 to 3 frost circles should appear. You can pixel stack the 4th set of cookies if you get them, but make sure you don't do it by the exit door. When it comes to Valina in the 2nd and 3rd rooms, it appears that she can be permanently immobilized if she is immobilized when she streaks across the room, but it isn't as easy to pull off as we would like. If she is immobile, she won't run back up to the tank, and will instead stay put after each teleport, making it easier to tank, heal, and keep a high time on target. At the start of the second room, we chose not to stack the first cages because they occur at the same time the fire dot is placed, just a few seconds after the boss is taunted. Since the fire dot increases in damage if multiple people stack near each other, it was safer for us to get in the formation shown here, with our tank turning the boss towards the exit, our two DDs flanking the boss on either side, and our healer behind them. Soon after the boss teleports, you'll get a cookies AoE. As the tank, you can place this in the corner by the exit door. The other three group members should pixel stack these opposite of where Valina teleported to avoid her second beam attack, which will be targeted at the tank. The second cookies will occur about 14 seconds after the first one drops and shortly after Valina teleports for the second time. The tank should expect a fire beam just after the cookies drop, so strategic placement is less important than surviving and being positioned to keep the beam pointed away from the group. The positioning of the DDs and healer are crucial for the second cookies because they will be followed immediately with the second fire dot. It's best for them to pixel stack and drop the cookies near the middle of the room on the boss's backside, that way they can keep a high time on target and remain within all the ground base hots the healer is providing to survive that fire dot. For the Lamakai portion of the second room, positioning is simple but important. The healer should always stand near the exit door. The DDs should pixel stack in the middle of the room. This will ensure the DDs are always in a predictable position for the healer to heal and the tank to avoid when the caged mechanic occurs. Also, it will guarantee the healer is the one targeted by the ensnaring spider. 
While we have some downtime, for reference, Lamakai enrages and needs to be frozen about once every 30 seconds. The ensnaring spiders appear about every 50 seconds, and the second cages appear about 34 seconds after the first cages disappear. I'm assuming that trend continues. If you did a good job placing cookies when Valina was out and are appropriately positioned here, there won't be much to worry about during the Lamakai portion of the second room, as the arena will be mostly clear of AoEs. It really trivializes the fight. As you prepare to go into the final room, keep in mind our working hypothesis is that Valina can be permanently immobilized again if you can figure out the timing. She teleports about 7 seconds after aggro. The goal is to achieve this outcome in order to maximize laziness for the group. In other words, the tank can stay out of the biggest damage dealing ability, the fire beam. The healer will always know where the DDs are because they're going to be stacked right up on the boss, and time on target is going to be very high because the DDs won't need to chase around a mobile Valina. They'll only need to move when she teleports. Every group member knowing the timing of the mechanics in this room is critical. Seven seconds after aggro, Valina will teleport. Then she'll put out cookies and beam the tank. Three seconds after the cookies land, the meteor will explode. The cages will start to come up a second later, and the big fire dot will hit just before the cages solidify. For a rundown of what each individual group member should be doing during this time, feel free to pause the video and check out the summary I have on the right. With the exception of the fire beam, which occurs every 20 seconds, and the fire cages, which our group only saw one of, the other mechanics occur at about a 38 second interval, at least for the first few cycles. That means after the second teleport, you'll get cookies, a meteor explosion, and a fire dot again. Once again, feel free to pause the video and check out the description of what everyone should do once Valina teleports the second time. Ideally, Valina will be dead before a third teleport. In case she's not, be ready for that teleport followed closely by a fire beam. The group needs to make sure they aren't lined up between the boss and the tank. Cages will come up awkwardly with the other mechanics this time as well, so be aware of that and maintain good positioning as described. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and leave a comment. For more of Aegis's laziest tactics and tons of other ESO tanking related content, please subscribe to my channel. Ensuring the 